Welcome everybody to Contemplating a Christian, and it's good to be back doing a dialogue. Um, and today we're going to be talking about angels. So this is something that been just kind of interesting recently. We've been kind of thinking about, and I think something we don't talk or think about enough. And so we'll probably title this something like, you know, we should think more about angels or something like that, because I think that they're a uh, sort of a piece of theology or a piece of um, scripture that we just kind of neglect and don't think about as much, especially in the modern day. And so we're going to talk about angels today, and particularly uh, John Calvin and his view of angels, because he thought and wrote a lot about angels and just the angelic realm and what they do, what they do in scripture, how they interact with us. Um, and that's super fascinating. So we're going to talk about that from this great uh, article that walks through that. But first, I kind of just wanted to kick this around. What are angels? We hear a lot about them. And maybe when we think about an angel, we'll think of, you know, a, a, a bare butt, chubby little baby that floats around with a harp, something like that. It's kind of kind of useless. But um, I don't think that's what angels are. And so, Samuel, what uh, what do you think? How would you describe to somebody what an angel is? Yeah. Um, so for angels specifically, they are misunderstood. So if you were, if you were going to read the Bible, you get a bunch of different descriptions. People, uh, people would say sometimes they appear as human beings. Sometimes they're like, uh, monstrous, um, monstrosities or, uh, something like that. So they're like the cherubim or something. Um, but in general, they are just pure spiritual beings with an intellect and a will uh, that is simply put. All right. So that's what we would describe an angel as. And for like what we're drawing from, we're going to be obviously using Calvin and we will put the article below, but we're also going to draw a little bit from Aquinas as well. Um, at least I am. But that, that in general, I would say is what an angel is, just an intellect and a will that is spiritual, doesn't have a body, um, so it's not physical like us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of in classical Christian thought for the broad span of church history, angels were thought of as yeah, disembodied minds, uh, just pure intellect or pure spiritual beings, as you said, and that you kind of see that stream and you get you know people like Aquinas talking about angels a lot. Um, I think kind of the classic, kind of the classic joke about medieval scholasticism is that they're talking about how many angels could dance on the head of a pen, that sort of idea, mm -hmm. and that just gets to that gets to the point that uh, in the scholastic period, in the medieval period, people thought about angels a lot, and Christians wrote a lot about it. And I'd say today we kind of have a a scarcity of that. There isn't much thought about angels, not a lot of writing mm -hmm. about them, and I think that kind of reflects the world we live in today a little bit. Mm -hmm. And maybe just since the enlightenment, we have sort of a mechanistic view of the world. Um, mm. We see just the world as this kind of big machine that kind of runs on its own according to fixed laws. And the spiritual realm is something kind of not really super related to our realm. Mm. And I think in the throughout church history, the, the natural and the supernatural were far more connected. Mm. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But just today we have, you know, some would call it a, a disenchanted world. Um, or we just, yeah, we think the world's a machine and angels don't really have a, a place in that, so to speak. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? So yeah, for, for our world, we do have a disenchanted view of reality as in classical thinkers, um, and actually the classical galaxy, uh, and the classical solar system and, mm -hmm. and all of that was connected to the supernatural. Right. So, the like even though it's we we could say like physically and factually incorrect that that old model because they have the incorrect number of planets and um and, and everything like that, but everything symbolized something with the stars and the planets and the heavens, and a lot of people thought that the stars actually represented angelic bodies. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was very enchanted. Now, did they actually believe that that was an angel up in the air flying with wings just hovering there? Um, probably not. Uh, actually, I would, I would say definitely not, especially if they believe that they were spiritual beings. But 
the important thing was it symbolized something and they they viewed it in that way and it was very comprehensive it was a natural and a supernatural view um and so when it comes uh, one more thing when it comes to angels and how they're represented or presented we do have to kind of question if it's a literal uh, physical description or not so like i said in the bible sometimes angels appear as humans sometimes they appear as like a bunch of eyes with wings so if an angel appeared to us in some way one because they're spiritual we would say it's not a physical thing um in the sense that we usually say it's physical um so we we just kind of have to be skeptical about how those descriptions work i would say and so even for like the flying babies with wings and harps that in and of itself might not be a biblical description but in art if they were depicted that way probably symbolizes something right yeah there's yeah it's not that there's no purpose to that but it's just that there's a variety of ways that angels are depicted certainly and going back to what you said about um kind of classical astronomy i think of like lewis and tolkien they certainly <laughs> seem to have you know had their fiction written with this sort of backdrop with the sort of medieval view of uh of the stars and the planets and the solar system being sort of um like you said there being symbolism behind all of it and so that's uh what that uh, michael ward planet narnia that whole book that kind of walks through the logic of the narnia series and how each book represents a different planet and those planets all have um kind of different um a different meaning behind it in mm -hmm. lewis's uh conception just the point being there's a whole logic behind the solar system that isn't just simply hot air and gas there's actually spiritual forces at play in all of that, which is fascinating. So that's a whole nother topic. But today we're going to get a little bit more into just Calvin's view of angels in particular, because I think he gives a pretty good overview that would be fairly agreeable to the Christian tradition generally about what angels do, particularly just in scripture. And just kind of starting right off the bat, we'll link this article as well uh, below. Um, but it's talking about how simply just how pervasive angels are in Calvin's thought. And he, he goes as far as saying that uh, this is B.B. Warfield kind of summarizing Calvin's thought on angels. And he says, there is at least a prima facie appearance that Calvin thought of them, angels, as the instruments through which the entirety of God's providential work is administered. So basically, he's trying to summarize Calvin's view of angels. And he says, literally everything that God does everything he does in his providence he does through the mediation of angels and he and he says this could be the um the uh execution of judgment and it could also be the the vicious blowing of the winds even that god does through the mediatorial work of angels which is fascinating so calvin has this huge uh, hugely pervasive idea of what angels do and how they function in god's economy um yeah, any thoughts on that, Sam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just that he uses them for pretty much everything. Um, now they don't get as much, we could say, screen time in the Bible as other characters or people or stuff like that, but they're always there in some way. So uh, we can go to Isaiah. Actually, yeah, that's the first thing that came into my head. Isaiah, when... That prophecy happened and there were the angels around God. But then, um, if I remember correctly, they uh, God used them to cleanse Isaiah's lips. All right, that's that's one thing. Uh, but then also, just in the New Testament, in the gospel, the good news to uh, Mary and announcing, hey, this is what's going to happen. You are about to uh, have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that, uh, that was sent through an angel um but then angels are just everywhere and uh paul mentions them in his letters like mm -hmm. uh saying principalities or powers of this world so they aren't necessarily just the title angel um but there's all these different words for them and there's different kinds of angels um and pretty much everything evil that happens or is happening is connected to fallen angels so Right. It's they're present everywhere. Right. And yeah, Calvin says 
<clears throat> Calvin says as much. He says, um, God works through the angels to direct human affairs. And this idea that you can think of this in like the book of Daniel. Angels are really pervasive throughout the book of Daniel, but you get this really interesting um, uh, character that shows up in Daniel called the Prince of Persia. Um, if you remember this, this uh, archangel Michael is, or is it Gabriel? I can't remember the one that talks to Daniel more, but uh, the good angel that shows up and, and talks to Daniel, he gets held up from um, coming to, to aid Daniel uh, because he's held up fighting the Prince of Persia, which is just like fascinating. It's just kind of thrown out there without, without a lot of explanation. But a lot of people think this is basically a fallen, a fallen spirit, a fallen angel that is that has this sort of dominion over evil empires. So like Persia and Rome and Babylon, the, these evil empires in the ancient world had evil powers presiding over them which is really fascinating. And likewise, you know, good empires, so to speak, had, you know, good angels that's, that kind of had dominion over that uh, to some degree, which is really interesting to think about. But you get this idea of the Prince of Persia, which is like, where is that coming from? Um, that so, also changes your conception of the, the movie and video game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a little bit. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a jolt from the past. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so going into then, Kind of four, uh, we're going to walk through kind of these four functions that Calvin talks about in reference to the angels and just kind of throw it around a little bit where we see it in scripture and um, what this means. So Calvin talks about angels as emissaries of God, mm -hmm. as min ministers of God's wrath, as guardians of God's elect, and then finally as admirers of the gospel of God. And so first, we'd love to just dig into what does it mean for angels to be emissaries, um, basically ambassadors or messengers of the king. Uh, angels are emissaries of God. What do we think about that? Yeah, they're emissaries. They send messages. <clears throat> so, um, well, I already, I already kind of mentioned the part about uh, announcing Jesus to uh, to Mary, but then also we can uh, see. Well, we can get into the philosophical side of it, I guess. So I, I was recently um, looking into Aquinas's view on this, and let's say an angel does appear and gives a message, um, but they're a spiritual being. So how does how does that work? How on earth does that work if they aren't physical? How are they showing up to someone, or at least that's what the Bible describes? Um, yeah. How does that work? And so Aquinas would say there, there are two ways to be present. Um, one is to be contained within like a space. Hmm. And that's what we typically think of like being somewhere. But then he said there's a second way, which is you can be present through your influence. And uh, an analogy for that is, let's say, a parent, like parents have a household and they have rules and the kids are at home. But let's say the parents leave. There is still some kind of presence mm -hmm. of the parents there through their rules and through their influence. And um, Aquinas actually says that that's how angels are are present a lot of the times, um, maybe even as emissaries. So if an angel were to give someone a message, um, doesn't necessarily have to be a physical uh, presentation, but maybe it's influencing that uh, space or that person with a message, with a message communicated through the mind or the intellect or something like that. Sure. Yeah, I think that's certainly a po certainly a possibility, and I I don't think that, uh, yeah, I don't know Aquinas' whole thought on that. I wonder if he would, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he would grant that there's some physical manifestations of angels, probably, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, just this idea of them being emissaries is, uh, they basically they speak on behalf of God. They're ambassadors for Him, and so they kind of carry His authority and His role. Um, and when they give a message, it's basically, this is a message from God directly, and I'm giving this to you. Uh, and so even like preachers of the gospel in the New Testament, and uh, there's, you know, people think um, like the angels in Revelation are, at least in the beginning, 
to the seven churches. Those are actually talking about the the pastors of those congregations, um, not necessarily physical angels themselves, but they're called angels as in messengers. Like the word angel just means messenger. And so some people think in Revelation, the beginning, uh, they're actually just pastors of the of the of the congregations uh, to the seven churches rather than a celestial being, so to speak. But just that simple idea that they speak on behalf of God and that being uh, one of their primary functions, which is fascinating. Uh, and then you get that crazy figure, uh, the very interesting figure of the angel of the Lord. And that could be a whole nother, we could do a whole nother mm -hmm. podcast on that. Uh, that's a fascinating character, whether that's a pre-incarnate Christ, uh, if that is him some of the time or all the time, that's a uh, really fascinating because you see the angel of the Lord like, like, accepting worship seems to be called God in different places or called Yahweh. So uh, that's a whole interesting discussion. Angels are emissaries. Yeah. And they, well, they represent God and they, well, they would appear to people and give messages. But then I think in the article, it says something like uh, he like God now chooses to teach us and instruct us through pastors and ministers of the gospel, mm -hmm. which is why um, there aren't like appearances of angels all the time. Now, some people might disagree with that a lot. Um, like, should we completely rule out appearances of angels to people? Mm -hmm. There are definitely some denominations that get more spiritual than others and say that they see uh, angels and fallen angels quite often. Um, but then other people say that they just don't see them at all. Right. So I think that's a good, like, it's a good thought right there as in, okay, because we have the gospel and scripture and people to lead us now, we might have reason to believe that angels appear less, but I don't think we should completely rule it out. Of, like with angels being emissaries, like can God still appear or uh, communicate with someone through the appearance of an angel? Um, yeah, it's possible. But is it 100% that there will never be another appearance of an angel to a human being? Um, well, that's a pretty big claim. Right. Yeah, it's hard to make absolute claims like that. Um, and then kind of moving on. So we have emissaries and then angels also function as ministers of God's wrath. Now, this one's really interesting, especially if you kind of grow up with the conception of angels as just purely these sort of cute, cuddly baby creatures. Um, yeah, not negating that there's symbolism to that. But um, if you only think of them in that light, then it like when you see them in scripture, you know, there's an angel that kills 185,000 Assyrians overnight. It's an angel that kills all the firstborn of Egypt. And so they're doing some pretty serious fighting in scripture, it seems. And um, certainly they, they kind of fight on behalf of God or fight on the, on behalf of, uh, God's elect, um, the people of God. Mm -hmm. And so you get this idea that angels are kind of the vehicle or the instrument by which God executes judgment, executes his wrath. Um, talk maybe a little bit Samuel about the, uh, the article talks about kind of elect angels versus reprobate angels. If you remember that part. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but first on the ministers of God's wrath. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's the instances of like in Exodus, the killing of the firstborn. But then I also, I personally think of Jesus when, you know, I think his disciples like tell him, hey, we should, uh, you know, fight these guys. Um, I think it might have been in the garden when he was about to get arrested. Yeah. But then he says, don't you think oh, or don't you know that if I wanted to, I could just call a bunch of angels right now from uh, the heavenly army to to fight. Right. Um, so there's just this idea that, hey, yeah, if if Jesus wanted to do so, he could just use angels to um, right. basically fight or deliver God's wrath or something like that. Um, now from, from the article, there are elect angels and reprobate angels. Um, and so here's, well, I can actually read this, uh, straight from the article. This is what it says. Mm -hmm. Um, 
On the other hand, as Calvin consider, considers all of scripture, he realizes this distinction, elect angels presiding over reprobate angels as reprobate angels carry out God's wrath is not always observed. So it seems like certain angels have functions and a lot of times these uh, so-called reprobate angels carry out God's wrath, but then there are elect angels which don't always carry out God's wrath, but could carry out God's wrath. And um, those ones, I, I think it's the elect angels and the examples you gave mm -hmm. that they were specifically told in those instances to deliver God's wrath. So for the Assyrians, right. the killing of the firstborn, <clears throat> that wasn't a reprobate angel that usually right. carries out God's wrath, but that was a specific instance of an elect angel deciding right. to uh, carry out God's wrath. Right. And I think that this gets somewhat speculative on Calvin's part. Um, this kind of idea that uh, God uses the elect angels to preside over and judge and and sort of uh, govern the executions of God's wrath through reprobate angels, that kind of hierarchy like that. It's very interesting. It could be true. Um, I have to read more into that to, to see how much uh, grounding there is for that scripturally. But it's a fascinating idea, and I think that there's some logic to it, that there's these different hierarchies for sure of angelic beings or spiritual mm -hmm. beings, and that the, like if we're going to, I mean, it says in, I think it's Second Corinthians, that we are to judge angels, which is just fascinating um, at the end of the world, that the that God's children will will judge angels eventually. Um, but if if that's true, then the idea that, you know, good angels are kind of governing over and have power over bad ones is certainly an interesting idea. You brought up Gethsemane as well. And I I tend to think that the in Joshua 5, the captain of the Lord's armies uh, that Joshua encounters, I, I tend to take that as a pre-incarnate Christ. So that's, that's the Logos who appears to Joshua and says, take off your sandals for you're standing on holy ground. Just like God says to, jo or God says to Moses in the burning bush, I think that Joshua also sees God there. Um, and then you have Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane as the captain of the Lord's armies, but he's not calling them down. He kind of willingly doesn't do that in his meekness, which mm. is just amazing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So for pre-incarnate Christs, I'm mm -hmm. just going to withhold from saying anything on that, <laughs> mainly because yeah. I have really no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to that. <laughs> I, I, well, no, I've had I don't like, either. Yeah, I've had like random thoughts for the Old Testament stuff, like, oh, could this be Jesus or, you know, yeah. the angel of the Lord? Could that be um, God presenting right. through Jesus? Because there are some angels that get pretty close to saying that they're um, very either in the highest position or very close to the highest position in the hierarchy, um, where it kind of makes you question if it was Jesus or not. But I've not done any research on that, really because I've been researching other things. Um, but it's a very interesting topic. I will say that. Um, but for hierarchies, I in, in the spiritual realm, I have done some reading and research on that. And one thing I think is clear from scripture is that there are hierarchies. We might not be able to figure out the exact hierarchy of like first, second, third position and uh, so on and so forth, but we do get clear and different titles and greater and lesser titles. Um, so, for example, we do know that archangels are greater than angels, right? And we get both of those titles in scripture. And like I said before, we get like principalities and powers and mm -hmm. um, dominions and thrones. And a lot of people take those spiritually, but we don't get a clear presentation of the exact hierarchy, but we know there is one. And just arguing from the idea that God has ordered the world in a hierarchical fashion, um, we could also say that he orders the spiritual realm in a hierarchical fashion. So there mm -hmm. must be a hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And just simply like <clears throat> the practical effect of us talking about this, and as we think about angels, is should humble us. It should, it should just make us go, wow, this world that God has made is so much bigger than us. Like, that's what I think about when I look, like, think about the solar system for a while. <laughs> think about mm -hmm. space. It's just like, oh my goodness, that's too much. Um, but that's the practical effect, too, of when we think about the spiritual realm and how much there is there that we don't even understand or see. And um, knowing that that does exist, 
uh, thinking about the story of um, Elisha and his servant as well in Second Kings, he talks about I think it's Second Kings, might be uh, yeah, Second uh, King, Second Kings six, I believe, where uh, Elisha sees all these angels that are coming to fight for them, and the servant has to have his eyes open to see it, um, where all he sees is the physical enemies in front of them. It's a fascinating story, mm. but just this is meant to humble us. The world we live in is is quite big and more than we see. But moving on, we have angels functioning as emissaries, as ministers of God's wrath, and then as maybe what people are more familiar with, servants or guardians of God's elect, God's people. Um, so I can think of Hebrews, the ending of Hebrews 1 says about angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve those who are to inherit salvation? Mm -hmm. So these crazy beings that you know have the power to wipe out 185,000 Assyrians in one night, or yeah, just these fearful, awe-inducing creatures that John is tempted to worship in Revelation, these creatures are sent to actually serve us. That's a pretty amazing thought. Like mm -hmm. that ought to push us back on our heels and like give thanks, like give thanks to God for just what you, just for the simple understanding that angels are meant to serve us. That should in invoke gratitude in us. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it should, but, uh, yeah, so they can serve. And also with serving, Calvin gets into guardian angels. Mm -hmm. Um, but angels as servants, just in general, yes, they do serve, um, doesn't necessarily mean just protect, but, uh, as in they can provide for people in some way, obviously through, um, the permission of God. Um, so for example, I've, uh, read and researched a little bit uh, about this and beyond just being a guardian angel. Um, if there are, there are, are like spiritual activities happening around us pretty much all the time. Um, some people have speculated and believed that angels can actually like help us intellectually uh, mm -hmm. as in God can use them to um, help us like just simple, uh, simply like think clearer or mm -hmm or have uh, new ideas or have holier thinking. So, I mean, also just think of like getting distracted if you're trying to read the Bible. I mean, angels are probably one of the ways um, or one of the means God uses to help you stay focused or help you study the Bible or something like that. So yeah. they can serve us intellectually, they can help with our will, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, gonna sneeze. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's coming. I'm I'm about to. It's it's just sitting there, and it's kind of annoying. Um, Sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah, because it, it it's been there for like five or ten minutes, and the, mm -hmm. you probably can see it in the video. Just me sitting here, almost ready to sneeze, and it just won't happen. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, maybe an angel will deliver you from that. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, no, but just I I do think it's a biblical impulse to think about that. Like if we think of. In First Peter 5, the devil prowls around us like a roaring lion seeking to devour us. Okay, it's not simply, like, I think it's a biblical idea to say um, that the fact that I'm not devoured all the time, I can probably owe that to some degree to angels that fight on my behalf. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a biblical idea. I can't be dogmatic about it, perhaps, but I think that that's, that's a fairly biblical impulse to think that way and to, and to give thanks to God for that. Like, thank you that you have, you know, think of the, of the psalm. I think it's Psalm 91. Um, the uh, angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear him. So like angels guard those who fear the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so fascinating. Uh, so we have, yeah. we could, it'd be a good so, to do a whole, whole nother <clears> talk <throat> on just guardian angels in general and whether we yeah. have a guardian angel or many. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Calvin does get specifically into like the encampment of angels. And so Calvin specifically believes that angels camp are like, not literally like camp, like a camping trip, but they camp around people as in many angels are always active around you trying to protect you or fighting or doing something. Um, and this is the controversial part of the article because before Calvin didn't really say anything controversial as in like deliver, oh, like administers of God's wrath. Okay. Emissaries. Okay. That's uh, 
great. They, um, they guard and serve. Okay, awesome. But then when you get into personal guard, guardian angel or not, um, he conflicts a lot, uh, specifically with someone like uh, Aquinas. So, I mean, I personally very much like Aquinas and he's someone I've, uh, I've read a lot. And so this is where uh, they clearly disagree and start um, coming up with different ideas. I will say that. Yeah, totally. And it'd be worth a whole nother episode just on the, yeah, the passage in Matthew, I think that talks about, um, I think that's maybe the strongest testimony to personal guardian angels, mm. but ultimately I do think it's sort of a, certainly a, maybe even less than a tertiary issue of which to disagree about. Um, mm. Finally though, kind of moving on to the last idea. And this is one of the coolest, I think is that, this is taken particularly from the ending of first Peter, first Peter one, uh, angels, not only are emissaries, ministers of God's wrath and guardians, but they're also admirers of God's gospel. And I think that this gets at the purpose of angels just in general, um, and the purpose of everything, which is God's glory and angels are admirers of God's gospel. So it sends at the end of first Peter one, that this gospel that's been, um, kind of the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints of God, as it says in Colossians, um, this gospel now and Christ and our salvation in him is something into which angels long to look. That's what it says. That's the phrase at the end of chapter one of first Peter. So the things mm -hmm. into which angels long to look is redemption, the story of redemption, salvation through Christ, uh, that God saved the world by the cross. That idea is something that angels don't really experience directly. Like they aren't saved by Christ of their sin in the same way that we are. They don't experience God in that way. Um, mm. And so they're kind of like looking at the gospel and going, hmm, I want some of that, uh, which is just fascinating. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, uh, I think the verse where it actually talks about that, like the, uh, the angels are greater than human beings. Um, but we received the greater gift yeah. and there that's always kind of could i never really have been able to figure that out it's it's been a mystery to me it's something i i just like to wonder about um mm -hmm. i'm sure someone has like written about it um and figured it out uh or maybe figured a lot more out than i have when it comes to this but um just this idea of God giving a greater gift to the lesser, even though angels are greater than us. And then, um, and all of that and just how that works. I think it's just fascinating that he did that. And I kind of like, part of me doesn't want to figure it out mainly because I just want to, uh, wonder about it and leave it mysterious. Uh, but I do think that's, that's really cool. Um, but the big point is that, angels and part of what they do is they do actually admire the gospel the central portion of scripture the center we could say of of all history the central event um that is what everything is focused around okay mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and if angels who are i think we can uh we can safely say that angels are probably smarter than us they probably know more than we do Yep. And if they are amazed by the gospel, we should be too. Yeah. Like we should, we should have a sense of awe as we think about what God has done for us through Christ. So we should follow their example in longing to look and being amazed at the, the gift of the gospel that we have in Christ. So yeah. just a short little video talking about angels. Maybe we'll talk about them more in the future. Maybe get into guardian mm -hmm. angels, angel of the Lord. That'd be fun stuff. Yeah. But for now, this has been. Uh, Calvin's view on angels and us dialoguing about it. This is the contemplating Christian. And as always, I'll leave uh, links in the description for stuff that we are referring to. And uh, as always, God bless. Mm -hmm. God bless.